Good morning, everybody. Morning. So, my name is Andy. I am dev like, sec ish, and opsy. And I've done a little bit of everything from development through database administration, operations, pen testing, DevOps, and all those roles for security for startups and enterprises. Security is a line item on my job description. So, I want to talk about how we can protect our users' data when the software that we rely on fails to protect us. I'll start with a high-level description of various attacks and then get into the guts of container security and these slides will be published afterwards. So, what are open source exploits? Vulnerabilities in commonly used open source code. A flaw or weakness in a system's design that can be exploited to violate the system's security policy. And the question of insecure containers. Do they really contain? What can they contain? And how have they defended against major recent vulnerabilities? Our users expect that their data is safe when they hand it over to us. So is it possible to protect all data? Surely our users should expect some level of privacy. But we can't protect data if code in the system has bugs and unspecified code paths. So is bug-free code possible? And if not, is anything completely secure? Or to lower the bar, is anything completely secure from teenagers? <laughs> And with all these leaks of personally identifying information, is our data more secure than it was 30 years ago? What this talk is about, security, the anatomy of some major open source vulnerabilities, the sort of things that set the internet on fire, how containers affect security models and defense from future vulnerabilities. So what is security? It can be broadly categorized as Availability, we access what we want, when we want to. Integrity, the editing of data can only be performed by permitted parties via permitted processes. And confidentiality, assets can only be read by authorised parties. So security is full knowledge and control of a system without reading users' data. So to achieve security, we must trust certain parties. <coughs> to encrypt our data in transit, we trust security providers like the Global Trusted Public Root Store, GPG, closed source operating system firmware and driver vendors. We trust various protocols, TCP IP, TLS, open standards, compilers, and we're trusting these guys not to have bugs that defeat our security <coughs> models. And most importantly, we trust open source, code that we can see and that we can audit and that has been audited and also sometimes when it hasn't. So why do we use open source? For cost, development speed, general adoption, security. Linus's law states, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix obvious to someone. So while open source has the potential to be more secure than its closed source counterparts, simply being open source is no guarantee of security. Uh, what does more secure matter when we want 100% security? Is anything completely secure? Recent breaches suggest not. Billions of users' data has been lost in the past few years. It's almost impossible to keep up with the roster of apology. Yahoo has lost over $350 million in valuation so far from the upcoming Verizon deal because of over a billion customer records lost. And even a company considered by most to be highly secure suffered an advanced persistent <coughs> threat with their networks permanently compromised over the last half of 2009 and failed to secure data belonging to Chinese dissident Ai Weiwei. Why does this matter? We're not culpable, right? Well, Yahoo demonstrates that breaches are expensive, but there's a moral argument. We should protect our employers and the users' data that they hold. A breach can have tangible effects. Bank breaches affect real people. Self-driving cars could be weaponized. Hospital computer systems failures are literally a matter of life and death. Civil engineers are held to much higher standards than we are. 
And with technology's ever-tightening grip on critical infrastructure and the tendrils of machine learning ensnaring new domains, it won't be long before engineers are held more responsible. Bruce Schneier, the cryptographer, recently made this point to Congress, and Uncle Bob Martin has been saying this for years. So we've covered the high impact of breaches and data loss. Let's examine things that have affected us directly. We'll go through some wide-scale open source software vulnerabilities from the last few years with a focus on web and container exploitation, their impact and mitigation, and see what part containers have to play. You may have noticed the glut of shiny, hyped logo vulnerabilities in the last few years. Do these logo vulnerabilities provide any value? Well, probably. The publicity seems like an exercise in self-promotion, but security researchers work hard for little remuneration and re need all the recognition they and their field can get. Logo vulnerabilities probably result in things being patched sooner. All the vulnerabilities discussed here will likely have affected a server that you administer or have interacted with. Whether that server was targeted is a question of the value of the data that it holds. So first of all, heart bleed. A catastrophic flaw in OpenSSL, a commonly used encryption library referred to as a modest code base of outsized importance. This was considered theoretically unexploitable by, ironically, Cloudflare, who put a competition out, which was proven within nine hours to be able to exfiltrate secure keys from their servers. They revoked and reissued all certificates, more on them later. Heartbleed affected 20 to 50% of all major sites at Disclosure and impacted Apache and Nginx, SSL, email servers, v VPNs. So what is Heartbleed? It's a problem in SSL Heartbleed handling. A heartbleed, a heartbeat is a message used to keep a connection open. A user sends a heartbeat question with an expected reply word to the web server. And importantly, they send the length of the expected reply word in that request packet. In this example, hat. It's unnecessary as the server should obviously be checking the length on the server side without trusting the client. So a malicious user can specify a fake length for the expected reply. In this example, 500 letters or bytes. And the server responds with the reply word and the next 500 bytes of private memory. That private memory should never be leaked. It contains private information about other connections to the server and the private encryption keys that we trust. And after the attacker has those keys, he can decrypt further information to and from that server, assuming he is in the right place in the network. And our security model is broken. We can't see this attack in logs, as it's performed during the initial handshake. And the poor guy involved missed validating a variable containing a length. An easy mistake to make, especially in C. Reading more, buffer than, reading more data than the buffer allows is called a buffer overrun, and this was discovered by fuzz testing OpenSSL with American Fuzzy Lop, or AFL for short, and address sanitizer. So a fuzzer is something that sends massive amounts of data, of random, sorry, random data, into a program. AFL is an advanced fuzzer and requires instrumentation of the target program with extra code to instrument code branches and use genetic algorithms to discover test cases, tracking code execution paths as it goes. Address sanitizer allows this to be done to uh, essentially crash the program on an untrusted code path so that AFL knows that it's found something. So the user mitigation for this, for OpenSSL, is to upgrade, revoke, redistribute all keys. Was OpenSSL more secure for being open source? Well, AFL requires the source code to instrument the fuzz in the first place. So this bug may never have been found without access to the code. Anecdotally, many closed source vendors who did not announce that they used the OpenSSL library around this time quietly upgraded. So how do containers help here? Well, they don't really. The host's memory was protected, but Heartbleed only leaks process memory anyway, i.e. the web servers, so containers don't help against this type of programming flaw. Heartbleed is essentially indefensible with the container, as the security checks are not at the right level. It's an attack on the implementation of a spec and application behavior, but containers do help. 
presumably a containerized system has using immutable deployment artifacts uses continuous delivery pipelines. So at least the quicker deployment within a container of OpenSSL mitigates the risk period during which the servers are vulnerable. So while there's no inherent defense from problems with protocols, upgrades are cheaper. In kernel and container terms, Heartbleed is like building a castle, securing the walls, and then having the guards give away the secrets to open the gates. So, on to the next vulnerability. Shellshock was a bash vulnerability that allowed privilege escalation by adding code to a specially crafted environment variable, containing a function declaration with the calling process executing the extra code. So while Heartbleed leaks data, Shellshock can be used to take over the host system. Some impacts, CGI web apps, SSHD, DHCP clients, OpenVPN again, and all Linux boxes, all free BSD boxes, and all post-91 Unix deploys, and all Macs. Basically the world for most of us here. Although happily Debian and Ubuntu are less vulnerable because their non default non-interactive shell is bin dash. Here's a demo HTTP request from VulnHub against a CGI application. The first line is the target path. The user agent line contains the exploit payload. The parenthesis is a function definition. The function is defined as a no-op within the curly braces. And then the command to run, invoking a shell, and then ping, id, and cat etc password. The lower half of this burp suite output contains the server's response. We can see the ping statistics, the call to ID, and the contents of the password file. You would only see this attack if you were logging HTTP headers in your logs, which is extremely rare. This bug was introduced with the initial implementation of function X and importing on the 5th of August 1989 by Brian Fox, Bash's original author. This was before HTTP existed, before the web was born, or before Linux was released. It would be incredible if this bug wasn't being exploited at some stage in that 25 year history. There are so many other CVEs associated with this bug, but it was eventually fixed by Florian Weimar of Red Hat in this patch. He said he found the bug after reflecting on an earlier bash bug he'd found months before. And of note is that the latter two bugs on this list were found with the use of American Fuzzy Lop again. The mitigation, upgrade. Was this more secure for being open source? Considering the breadth of the impact and the time it took to find, probably not. But did containers help? Totally. They isolated the attacker to the container running the web server. The host was isolated, so the impact of the breach cushioned, assuming no further escalation. And opposed to Heartbleed, this is a remote command execution. So we can contain the command when it's run on our servers and protect the host. Back to the castle. The perimeter is secure, but this is analogous to allowing a Trojan horse to enter through the gates of the castle, but then locking it in the dungeons. It's inside the castle, but it can't do any further harm. When its malicious contents get out and look to do more damage from the inside, they can't get out of the jail. They can be observed and controlled. Next vulnerability, drown. An attack on TLS stands for decrypting RSA with obsolete and weakened encryption. And because it's a protocol attack, similar to Heartbleed, it can't be defended with containers. The problem here is old US export grade cryptography. 33% of all sites were vulnerable at disclosure, the mitigation disable SSL2 and upgrade OpenSSL, changing any secrets that may have been leaked. As a side note, there are a lot of TLS attacks that containers can't help with. Why so many and why the cluster after May 2013? Well, post Snowden, a renewed vigor has been applied to verifying encryption protocols and algorithms as developers search for intentional or accidental vulnerabilities. Although admins are at fault for running a vulnerable cipher, despite it being the client's responsibility to initiate the exchange, so is TLS more secure for being open source? Well, considering the complexity of the attack and the combined expertise required by this cavalcade of researchers and domain experts, this suggests the attack would remain the territory of state level actors. Back to the castle, this is like securing the entrance to your castle with an obstacle and only allowing people over a narrow secure bridge 
and then turning a blind eye as the moat is drained and continuing to trust it provides security. Do containers help? This is a protocol attack. No amount of containers are going to help us from broken protocol specifications. The only benefit we reap is being able to redeploy quickly. Dirty cow. This is more recent and is a Linux kernel bug. Root on every Linux kernel since July 2007. That's 2622. Was this more secure for being open source? Considering Linux's law, probably not, given the time it was open for and it was being exploited in the wild. So the URL is dirtycow.ninja, truly the worst of all logo vulnerability URLs. It's a race condition in the kernel. Again, on every Linux device, embedded devices probably have no path to upgrade and remain vulnerable. An exploitation of this bug does not leave any trace of anything abnormal happening in the logs. The mitigation upgrade the kernel. Of note, this bug was found in the wild by the researcher involved by recording all traffic into his server. Running a rolling, one of his sites was compromised, he was running a rolling packet capture and he extracted the exploit and tested it in a sandbox. <laughs> so how did containers help? Well, they didn't contain this bug. Containers rely on the kernel for protection, namespacing, C groups, the invocation of security extensions. If the bug is in the kernel, there's nothing containers can do. Back to the castle. It's like building a castle on the biggest rock you can find and then being surprised when somebody enters through a tunnel and steals the crown jewels. If the kernel lets the containers guard down, the container can do nothing. Or can it? We'll demonstrate this exploit in a moment and then look at how to secure ourselves against unknown kernel bugs. But a couple more vulnerabilities first. This is a run C exploit in Docker 12.5 and previous that allowed the main process of a container, if running as root, to gain access to privileged file descriptors. Not running as root inside a container helps this, but the fix is to upgrade Docker. And honorable mention goes to Cloudbleed, revealed Friday the 24th of February. An error in an HTML parser triggered the same error as Heartbleed, a buffer overread, and leaked private data in the response mixed with valid HTML. The code was closed source and the symptoms noticed in Google's caches and reported. This probably could have been more secure if open source, but it's difficult to say. There's no way in a month of Mondays that containers could help. This is an application issue and containers contain processes, not portions of their memory. So what do these vulnerabilities have in common? Humans inevitably making mistakes. The people reporting these open source bugs were not part of the project teams, so opening a project up to a huge pool of resources has demonstrated some advantages. Fuzzing applications yields fantastic results, this should be performed whenever practical, and containers are not a panacea. There are plenty of vulnerabilities that they either cannot stop or are not configured to stop, and we'll examine these shortly. Also, there is no way to compare this to closed source, as we don't have an equivalent disclosure method for proprietary software. A brief call to arms, you can help open source, review other people's code, fuzz and break things, and if you depend upon projects for your privacy, donate to them. And finally, major vulnerabilities in the kernel, TLS and remote execution for the last few years had no initial mitigation except update now. So let's demo a container breakout with Docker. This is potentially the most insane attack to demo because it relies on a race condition, and I'll demo it inside a VM. And my CPU is probably, I'm actually powered on, so there's no stepping down. But it's the most recent and potentially the most dangerous. It affects all Linux kernel versions since 2007, and all Docker versions. Being a kernel bug, the container syscalls hit the host. If you have a server that hasn't been updated since October the 18th, 2016, then you're vulnerable. So we're inside a Vagrant instance, and we, we're in Tmux. So the windows we have here, oh, there's no mouse. So where do I set my leader as? Hmm. There we go. Uh, right. So what we have here is 
we're running the scripts. We've checked for the Linux exploit suggester, and we've started a few other windows. So we've got Sysdig running in this pane here. The process name is aptly dead beef. Uh, that will trace the process as it runs. Then in the second, third window down, we will watch for communication on port 1234, which is after the race condition has been triggered, it will open the connection back to the host, from the host rather, to the container on port 124. So we'll see that. Um, at the bottom here, uh, penultimately, we have D message. And finally, the exploit detects whether it's been run already by writing to temp.x. So currently, that doesn't exist. That file, assuming the race condition completes, will be created and owned by root. So it's probably also worth noting here from inside the container, just having a look what's running. So, so we have uh, <laughs> yeah, in vagrant. So we have here we go. Uh, the Docker process here, uh, and so obviously from within the container, we shouldn't be aware that we are in the Docker process, but that's still on the virtual machine host. So we construct here the Docker file, adding a few essentials. There is the dirty cow virtual dynamic shared object attack. And we're ready to go. Let's try. So here we've got uh, Linux exploit suggester telling us that we're running kernel 420. It's old, it's vulnerable, and there are plenty of other things that it's vulnerable to. I might just move that slightly. Okay, uh, and here we have Dirty Cow, so just some corroboration. <coughs> Do we want to run this with App Armor? Well, initially, no. So, there we are, we're seeing the ptrace system call as the exploit initially advises the, uh, the kernel that it wants to change the usage of a piece of memory with the memory advise call there. And then by hammering that and changing a piece of memory from privileged to ideally unprivileged and attempting to trace the system call as it does so, ideally at some stage will trigger a race condition. Uh, so we're on the first of two patches and we see here that we have succeeded. Wonderful. So, at the bottom, we have evidence in that that file is now created and owned as root. Uh, here we can see that we've called back to the container process. Uh, this is running well behind time because of the huge volume of system calls that go through. You can see it's still on 11.42 and 8 seconds. It's gradually moving forward. But if we have a look here, whoops, at what processes we have running, we can see from inside the container, we have our Docker services on the host. So this now means we have root on the host system, which in this case is a, uh, a virtual box image, from within inside a Docker container, <coughs> having essentially pulverized the security model. So this exploit is only possible because the kernel is at fault. There's little that Docker can do easily. And we will come back to this later. Right, so onwards. Uh, so to recap, we can't secure everything. We know that there are problems in software development that will always generate bugs. Nothing is entirely secure. Appears to have stepped on something, there we go. Uh, the cost of formally specifying everything is incredibly high. And security struggles to keep up with DevOps. The DevOps revolution means shipping software fast sacrifices security. Unless we want to be penalized for insecure software, our competitors that deprioritize security for features will likely win user mindshare and will go bust. Because, as we all know, speed of shipping features is a competitive advantage. This is the case across everything. We're not going to win by slowing down. So back to software. Is it possible to write bug-free code? only with sufficient time, and conformance to specification doesn't guarantee the absence of exploitable bugs. So what can we do? 
NIST has published a state of the art. This subject is too broad to cover now, so I'll leave these notes in the slide for posterity, but essentially measure everything, <coughs> including your process metrics, obviously use skilled development teams, continue to measure the cost of quality, and these are the general overview. But out of these, one really stands, oh, in fact, sorry, one more point. This is a good time to name drop uh, David Wheeler's Secure Programming How To. Uh, but from the list of development and testing, what stands out? Resilient architecture. We know we can't defend ourselves against encryption protocol attacks, but we can defend against application and kernel attacks. So let's examine vendor best practices with regards to deploying containers. So where do containers excel? Speed of deployment, CI and test, portability, isolation without overheads, and security. Well, excluding the fact that integration with advanced kernel security features was a relatively recent feature in Docker's existence, the kernel doesn't provide namespaces for some devices and kernel subsystems, C groups and kernel modules among them. There's the age-old criticism of running the Docker daemon as root, although the authorization plugin should start to mitigate this and rootless run C is coming. And the oldest of critiques, containers make isolation trade-offs versus a hypervisor. There's a shared kernel, we understand the advantages listed previously, and should we require further isolation, we can run in a VM, which is as all the major cloud providers do. But the good, they prevent many attacks through isolation and a strong default configuration. And this continues to get tighter. They encourage minimal attack surface by reducing dependencies inside the container, speed of deployment, the migration from OpenSSL, for example, and content trust image signing and verification gives us a chain of trust in deployments. They also provide native log drivers for many endpoints, providing clear post-mortem analysis. So containers have prevented many vulnerabilities by default. This is a list of some of the security non-events. So how does, oh, in fact, notably unmitigated are the kernel issues discussed earlier. So how does Docker provide the security hardening? Namespaces are the most straightforward form of isolation. They provide a different view of the kernel for each process running within a container. So process namespaces mean that one process can't see the process running on the host. In the kernel since July 2008, for example, the process ID namespaces. Any time a program starts, it gets a unique ID in its namespace that differs from its ID on the host system, and each container has its own set of PID namespaces for its processes. They exist for various other things. The user namespace is still under development in the kernel <coughs> and is arguably the most essential outstanding feature. As of Docker 1.10, they are supported, but only allow you to map to non-root users rather than being true namespaces. Control groups are another key component of Linux containers, offering CPU, memory, disk, I.O. and network accounting and limiting. They help to prevent denial of services and fairly share resources. Docker runtime configuration. We can set read-only file systems, limits on PIDs for fork bomb proofing, security options, pass no new privileges, and don't allow a container to upgrade its security profile with the kernel. <coughs> kernel capabilities. These are process restrictions, capabilities enabling fine-grained access control to a system, rather than just I am root. The kernel has over 600 system calls, and a bug in any of these could lead to a privilege escalation. So only those necessary for a container to do its job should be allowed from within the container. This reduces the chance that application vulnerabilities are exploitable. And this can also protect us from Dirty Cow. Dirty Cow relies on a process trace system call called ptrace which allows a process to inspect and change the states of itself or another process. This is legitimately used inside a container for PS and strace. The exploit uses ptrace trace me, a ptrace called on the calling process. So Docker's AFPARMA profile allows this, ostensibly for PS within, inside, within the container. So we'll look at how this affects security in a moment. Docker drops a huge number of system calls automatically to restrict the behavior of containers and reduce the exploits available to malicious code inside them. A few recommendations there, hardened kernels are unlikely, people don't like compiling their own uh, kernels. So security policies and system call whitelisting. 
These allow a more fine-grained control over the kernel caps previously described. These restrict what can be done inside a container and is often the most secure way to prevent unauthorised behaviour, but the complexity of configuration dissuades most people. SecComp was developed by Google and it's used inside Chrome. AppArm and SD Linux are the Red Hat and Ubuntu specific flavours and Tomoyo is another kernel hardening feature. So who uses security policies? The right hand side is production, it comes in at about 24%, not really suitable for production workloads. There are various things that people can do when running and defining containers, always drop to an unprivileged user, run from scratch if possible to reduce the attack surface, remove non-essential applications. Importantly, a lot of debug tools are shipped in containers and it's possible to attach to the namespace, in this case double hyphen net container and a container ID brings up a busybox container in the network namespace of the target container. This can also be done for processes, into process communication. This negates the need to install debugging tools alongside your applications. You can attach tools like Sysdig to perform the same, tools like Sysdig will perform the same inspection but running as privilege on the host. Avoid running privileged containers permanently because they offer no security protection and remove super user ID binaries. Drop all capabilities and then add back the necessary capabilities as required. Use user namespaces, apply resource constraints and use the security options whitelists that are available. Ensure the integrity and the publisher of all the data a system operates on by using content addressability. This is provided by Docker in a tool called Notary and Content Trust gives you the ability to verify both the integrity and the publisher of all data received from a registry over any channel. Kubernetes also offers security contexts. Two levels of security context, pod and container, both doing the same thing at different levels and sharing the same syntax. Runners non-root runs the container mapped to a non-root user outside the system, again using the namespaces endpoints that we've uh, used the namespace endpoints we were talking about before. Uh, and the other is self-explanatory. So, now if we repeat the container breakout, enabling security features, we'll see how ptrace is permitted for some tracing operations, as Docker knows it's a problematic system call, but we'll modify the AppArm profile to remove the exemption. Okay, so back in, I've got to get the Tmux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, the same script, but we are running, uh, we are going to run this with AppArmor this time. So what we see here is this is the original AppArmor uh, configuration. And this line, importantly, ptrace, trace and read, peer, docker default. This allows us to use these essential sysadmin tools. However, so by changing those, so all, all we've done is comment out that line, removing the uh, exemption for ptrace. And we can see, we attempt to run this and we very quickly seg fault because the app armor profile in the D message output has denied based on the profile that we've added. So it's very simple, very powerful. We can see the benefits of applying security policies even when Docker applies some of them for us. Based on the assumption that no one will ever write these things by hand, which seems to be borne out, there are some great tools to generate these profiles for you during application development. Gen Setcomp is a simple bash script to get you started. Docker Slim can auto-generate a Setcomp profile from static and dynamic analysis of a container or an image. And Bane is the basis of an AppArmor proposal for Docker Core that intends to fall back to set comp and capabilities if necessary. Finally, the Weaveworks and Container Solutions Sock Shop demo is a shining example of well-configured Kubernetes manifests. These are all things you can do while the image is still in the hands of developers, but what about the pipeline? This is my GIF competition entry for the day. The weakest link is a likely exploitation point. So, Preventing secrets from leaking out into the pipeline. These cover preventing secrets from entering Git and scan for already committed secrets. 
Some of these can run on your developer's machine as a pre-commit hook, as well as in a pipeline. GitLab can run server-side pre-received hooks. GitHub Enterprise supports this feature. And if you don't trigger your, if you don't host your own, you'll need to trigger web hooks, web hooks, and be responsive on Sunday at 4 a.m. <coughs> Static analysis for Git repos. Truffle Hog searches for entropy as a way of detecting keys. This is good for finding random strings, but for non-random strings, i.e. passphrases, it falls flat. If a string isn't long enough, it probably doesn't have enough entropy to be caught by Truffle Hog. For example, it doesn't find AWS access keys. However, AWS labs have their own tool, Git Secrets, which definitely finds AWS access to keys, but requires a lot of configuration. So it's probably easier to run both of these tools than hyper-configure each individual one. Git Hound is similar, but with less stars. And Git Rob is a GitHub API scanner that's more of an attack tool. Docker container scanning. Most of these tools pull from the NIST, NVD, and a variety of context-specific sources. Operating systems like Debian, Red Hat, and Alpine, and registries such as Maven and NPM. Claire is CoreOS is offering, self-hosted or used against their API, and it statically analyzes the contents of container images. This will detect all the vulnerabilities covered so far. Linus is written by the same author as Rootkit Hunter, and although cheating slightly, because the Docker plugin is enterprise only, it's partially open source, and gets a special mention for gritty old school aesthetics. Docker Scan is a new tool announced at RootedCon Spain, with a different angle on standard static analysis, with some malicious, malici blah, malicious sidelines in Trojanizing. <coughs> This is an attack tool, so it doesn't produce CI-friendly outputs, but it can be wrapped in a script to identify a few vulnerabilities. OpenSCAP is now folded into Red Hat's OSCAP tool, and Banyan Collector collects information and enforces policies, but requires the, requires the container to be spun up to run scripts inside it. All these guys can do pretty incredible intrusion detection, scanning, hardening, and more, but I can't differentiate between them because I haven't used them all. Host analysis, Docker, and so this is analyzing the host system for vulnerabilities, and the second is the one that I used in the container breakout demo for posterity, and Docker Bench is produced by Docker. It verifies best practices for production deployments. Application dependency analysis, these cover transitive dependencies, for example, OpenSSL, but also a multitude of open, other open source products. Most places don't have an exhaustive inventory of the software that they use because it's exhausting. And the first link is actually an OWASP tool. For Java and .NET with experimental support for Ruby, Node, Python, and it will integrate with everything from Sonar to Jenkins. Uh, SNCC gives you the same type of information in a hosted dashboard, although it's triggered from the build for Node, Ruby, and soon Java. And it'll submit the PR you need to stay up to date. This is the fuzzer used in the Heartbleed and Shellshock attacks referenced earlier, along with the complementary address sanitizer. Fuzzing can take a long time, so ideally runs in a parallel pipeline rather than a stage that can break a build. And these we're probably all familiar with. Web application scanning is a talk in itself, but these probe for specific configurations and behaviors and overlap with component acceptance tests. Are these ports open? This path responds with X. This path requires a client certificate. BDD security has the nicest scripting interface, in my opinion. So, how do we stay secure? We've seen that zero days melt the internet and can bypass current state security models, and that we'll always have more as humans are fallible. <coughs> but there are many other attack vectors, manual misconfiguration, malicious internal actors or Snowdens, functional bugs, purposeful malware, not to mention the application code we're deploying. So. We can have a quick update mechanism in place, but how do we stay secure against the swathe of vulnerabilities, apart from enforcing the tightest security policies we can manage? Well, our cyber securities are based on physical metaphors. Keys, passwords, backdoors, tampering, eavesdropping, phishing, although perhaps clickjacking is yet to find an equivalent. And the metaphor continues. We don't make our houses or possessions available to everybody. We lock them, we monitor them, we alarm them, because we can't be sure they're always safe. This is referred to as defense in depth, and the cyber version of an alarm is an intrusion detection system. Doesn't matter which one of these you run, but as long as you run one of them in production, you're all good. I've reached the end of my time, so we're almost there. Is anything inherently secure? No. 
Open source software more secure than proprietary? Not really. <coughs> it is secure enough for our needs, but it would probably be hacked by something on the OWASP top 10, not by an open source vulnerability, something you've constructed yourself. So you prepare for the unexpected, secure your networks, your application code, your users' browsers, and when all else fails, run intrusion detection systems. Thank you very much.